Let's talk cheating, boys and girls. I'm joined once again by the one and only Dr. Sean Anderson, recent med school grad. Check him out on Sean Anderson, linked below. And we covered the Nepal cheating scandal last time. Today, we're gonna do a follow-up. So we're gonna answer some questions about the Nepal cheating scandal. And also talk about cheating in med school and in college beyond the big thing that happened in Nepal. So if you go to our Med School Insiders video that also covered the Nepal cheating scandal, you're gonna see comments like, I still don't understand why practicing with past questions is considered cheating. How is memorizing a fact you learned in the form of a question cheating? Another one, recalls are the best way to practice. No serious test maker should repeat the same question twice, right? Wait, so Kaplan and other expensive test prep centers should be illegal based on this, especially for the SAT? And I thought there was some real cheating done here. So using UWorld is not cheating. If they really wanna do something, then better start making new exam questions. It shows their incompetency that in all these years, they haven't been able to generate new questions. Since when memorizing potential questions is cheating? All right, you get the idea here. So Sean, what is the problem and why is there so much confusion? Yeah, so like these comments are saying, students use recall all the time to help them study for future exams. So why was it an issue in this case? Well, when you take a USMLE exam, you are signing a contract beforehand that says you are not going to discuss the contents of the exam outside of the exam center. So by signing that agreement, you're saying that I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm not gonna share the questions. The reason being is that so many people are taking this, this test throughout the year that the test maker is not able to constantly make new tests for every single question. To create a question and to make sure that it doesn't have uh, different response rates based on bias and whatever, to make sure it's a totally fair question, takes a lot of time, energy, money, etc. And if you want them to constantly be making new questions, cool, it's gonna cost a lot more. And that cost is of course gonna get passed on to you. So those who are talking about Kaplan and UWorld, that's different, that's a test prep company who's making their own questions to mm. approximate what the real test is like. But those are practice questions. And the hope is that by doing those practice questions, you're learning the, the reasoning, the, the actual knowledge, the, you know, whatever you need to actually know to do well on the real thing, but you're not trying to memorize the question answer combo. Exactly. The question recalls aren't testing your knowledge. Uh, there's been some comments and some confusion about that too, which is that, well, if they memorize the questions, then they clearly know the knowledge. No, no, no. You're just memorizing a question answer, like a question stem and an answer. Boom, boom, boom. You're not actually understanding the reasoning why. That's the big problem. Exactly, and again, if you're kind of breaking that contract that you're signing with the test makers that you're not going to be discussing the contents of the exam, you know, sharing them with other test takers, then, you know, it kind of makes sense that your exam is gonna become invalidated. You know, you're, you're breaking your agreement so they don't owe you that exam score afterwards. And it is, it is cheating. It is cheating because you are, you are memorizing the combination of question and answer before you even see the test. And you're now inflating your score much higher than it would normally be if you didn't have access to those, um, those recalls, those unfair, that, those unfair questions that give you an unfair advantage over other students, right? So if we're trying to test and ensure the competency of those who are practicing medicine in the US, I don't want them to use recalls that are the actual live questions. Big problem. Gotta adjust my third watch real quick. <laughs> Got my Apple watch here, my whoop there and... In case Kevin doesn't know what time it is. He's got three. Gotta be prepared, man. Three watches on. You never know. And if anyone doesn't think that the scores- It's all about time management, you know? Yeah. Productivity, hashtag. Yeah. If anyone doesn't think that the scores are being inflated, we should put the graph right here that shows- Nepal versus where all Nepal, the other countries. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm surprised it wasn't caught sooner, honestly, or that it wasn't looked into sooner. When you have an outlier like that on a yeah. graph, like it's gonna raise questions. It's gonna, you know, people are gonna start looking into it and it was a matter of time. There was a Twitter thread we also came across from Dr. Brian Carmody, and he's been providing great updates mm -hmm. on the Nepal cheating scandal, by the way. So long story short, essentially those who uh, were caught cheating, they have, was it six or nine months? Six to nine. That's like the max that they have is that nine month cutoff. Six to nine months to retake the test, no cost to, to them. Completely free. Which is nice. That's great. I, very nice of them. To yeah. Offer. And there was one other uh, stipulation, right? However, even if you do take the exam in that six to nine month window, your invalidated exam will still be uh, seen by programs when you apply. It's still gonna be there. The program directors, they can see all of your prior attempts mm -hmm. for step one through three, and it'll say invalidated score 
um, on that score report. So they'll know, like, they'll know something's up. Overall, I still think that this is plenty fair, if not generous, by the NBME. And I think that those who are, who are crying foul, I don't know, the sense that I get is that they're probably cheaters themselves, or they like, or I don't know, they're, they're, they might be involved in, in some way, because to me and the people that I've spoken to, it's a very clear line. And those who are in medicine in the US who are in med school or have graduated that I've spoken to about, they say, I mean, this is like, this is a huge, huge violation of just the integrity of medical education, medical training and testing to make sure that we have competent physicians. Exactly, and I think a lot of the people who are on that side of, you know, this isn't cheating, they shouldn't be, you know, getting penalized for this, they kind of forget about that, you know, breaking of a contract. And that's that's the principle of this whole thing. It's not about the method and recall and all that stuff. Those are common Yeah, you techniques. signed an agreement saying that you are not gonna do that. Exactly, <laughs> that's what this is about. That's why the test scores are being invalidated. That's the problem here. All right, let's shift the conversation now to cheating, not on NBME, but just like, college, med school, high school in general. This is something that admittedly, if I'm being totally honest, wasn't even on my radar. Maybe it's the people you hang out with, maybe it's the prevalence at a, you know, I'm dating myself of course. Uh, I went to college 2008 to 2012. And the one time I heard about Adderall and other stimulants being used by those who do not have a prescription for it, like if you have a prescription, no problem. I think it was on the local news towards the end of my college career. And then in med school, I never really heard about cheating at all. Uh, maybe my circle, no one was really asking me about, hey, do you have these stimulants? Or hey, do you wanna cheat in this way? Like, it would just work your ass off, study, do well, repeat. Yeah, I totally agree. I think in high school and in undergrad, I think I saw a little bit more cheating behavior, not a whole lot, just, you know, students, um, you know, having old exams that they got from upperclassmen. Well, um, I, I do think that studying from older exams is a very useful tool as long as you're allowed to do so. So like, yes, oftentimes professors will give you the old exams and they'll say, hey, like use this as a, as a study resource. Loved when they did that, especially like in, in chemistry, mm -hmm. because the new test was different, but it was testing the same concept. So if you understood it from the practice test, you're good. Now the issue was that if somehow the student like stole or kept a test they weren't supposed to keep and then use that and mm -hmm. gave that to someone else because now the teacher wasn't expecting it to be distributed exactly. and now that those questions are being reused. Yeah, or um, you know, in undergrad, you'll have like one professor that teaches multiple blocks of the same co course. So some students might take an exam the day before another block of students takes that same exam. And so some of those students would discuss uh, with those students, you know, oh, I saw this on the exam, I saw this question. And a lot of times those professors just write one copy of the exam. I don't, I didn't see a whole lot of multiple variations of one exam. Yeah, I would hope that the professor would very quickly, if they could see there is a, uh, a difference in the average score, the score distribution between those two groups of people, they'd yeah. be like, okay, something fishy, something fishy is going on, I gotta put an end to that. I think it kind of depend on the professor too. Like some of those more tenured professors that were kind of just, you know, kind of done. They were just going in, teaching the class, going home. Um, you know, reusing a lot of their old exams. Uh, I feel like they weren't so good about it. I had an anatomy professor who was a younger guy and he did have different versions of his anatomy exams depending on which block you were taking it in. Hmm. Some comments we got on our video talking about the NBME cheating scandal. A lot of people condemning these people, crying that it harms patients, yet I knew at least a quarter of my classmates to have cheated to various extents or done other unethical things. Funny how students and residents think they're perfect saints. Y'all need to look in the mirror. Before anybody at me, I'm perfectly average US, US assembly scorer. I gain nothing by defending these morons. Um, first of all, a quarter of your classmates? That's insane. I'd be curious to know what program are you at? Yeah, um, that's insane. That's, that's, that's insane. And um, other unethical things, I'm not sure what you mean by that. But a quarter of people cheating, I don't think that's happening in the US at US schools, not that I'm aware of. That seems- that, that's, that sounds inflated. I, at least from my experience as someone who's just now finishing med school, all of our exams were heavily proctored. We had two proctors for every single exam. Every exam was in person. The entire cohort took it in the exact same room. You know, all the bags were in the back. You couldn't have anything on you. If you needed to go to the bathroom, you had, you know, someone had to know. It was pretty, you know, heavy duty proctoring. Like you really couldn't get away with anything on those exams. I find it hard to believe that 25% of students in someone's school is cheating, unless that's that school is not 
you know, proctoring, if they're online exams, if they're in-house exams that are professor written and then they're just being passed around. I, I don't really know how that number is possible. One thing, I mean, you talking about that makes me think about the exams that we took mm -hmm. and it was like in a large lecture hall Yeah. and backpacks everything away. I think it was, I think it was pen and paper. Like, are you guys doing uh, like Scantrons? Or Ours is on a laptop. Digital? Okay, I, yeah. I guess back in the day. You guys did pen and paper? <laughs> pen and paper. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so is it your laptop? No, it's like a school issued laptop that has, you know, a program specifically, you know, I have to like put in my like NC ID or whatever. Dude, I'm and like, shit. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> pen and paper, oh my God. I remember the last time I like used a pencil for an exam. I actually don't. I don't think I've owned a pencil in years. Yeah, wow. That's um, crazy. <laughs> I don't even consider myself that much older than you. I'm 33, you're 27? 27, yeah. A lot's happened But I guess a years. lot, yeah. <laughs> Cheating was incredibly prevalent when I finished up college in 2016. I finished college in 2012. Uh, people were abusing Adderall all the time and cheating on exams like coursework. The outcome is more important than the process, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so again, maybe that's like, I think part of it is also the people you associate with. I was obviously mm -hmm. associating with like, hardcore Indian guys that like just wanted to study and like got <laughs> doctors, so like that was the norm. I mean, for those who don't know, I was like, I was on the Bhangra dance team. Like that was a lot of my social life and then I you just You should like really studied. insert a clip of that uh, let's somewhere. Not, let's like, not, let's it's not. It's beautiful, you guys gotta see it. Let's not. Um, but maybe it's like your social circle, maybe it's the institution you're at, I don't know. But I, I do have some more like, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's talk about the principles of cheating and not cheating. I made some videos in the past, I think on Med School Insiders about like Adderall and Ritalin, we'll have it right here. I remember getting so many comments about like, yo, this guy definitely popped Addies. And like all these comments saying, there's no way that you can be successful without doing X, Y, and Z. And that is mm -hmm. such a limiting belief. So for those who don't know, I have inflammatory bowel disease and there was one stimulant I tried many times, caffeine. Coffee. A girl I was dating in med school got me a gift. It was like a French press. Oh, nice. This was right before step two. So end of third year. And if you know me with tea, like I was like that with coffee. Oh, so I was, like, I was like getting into it, you know, like yeah. reading up and like the bird, like how, how finally- Studying you, just like down to like- I was having fun. Gram. I was having fun, like, you know, calculating the water temperature and the timing and the, yeah. anyways, the agitation. And uh, I drank coffee. It was only like one cup every day for four or five days. And I was like, I'm, like, I'm gonna spare you guys the details, but me in the bathroom got acquainted in a way where I was like, let me just not drink coffee anymore. And um, <laughs> and even before that, I never really did much caffeine because mm. I don't know, like it just didn't appeal to me as much. I think if you feel like you need to rely on anything, it is a self-limiting belief. And it is now gonna cap your ultimate potential because now, first of all, you know that you need X, Y, or Z, whether it's caffeine or Adderall, or whatever else, to do the things that you did. You're now telling yourself that you're not good enough to do it without that mm -hmm. crutch. When in reality, if you tried it without the crutch, you could probably work up to a very similar level. And now you're building that self-efficacy, you're building that confidence and you're expanding your capacity so that in the future, when things get harder and harder, you have that resilience to push on. Yeah. And you wonder why imposter syndrome is so common nowadays. And people ask me, hey Kevin, how did you deal with imposter syndrome? Bro, the only imposter syndrome I had was in med school. I got the number one top merit scholarship at UCSD because you know, my MCAT GPA. And um, I remember talking to like the assistant dean or someone, I'm like, hey, I'm so grateful for this, but I feel like I'm letting you guys down because on my tests, I'm not always number one. Mm -hmm. And like, in hindsight, it's fucking ridiculous because there was, I was number one on cardiology, I was like number three on neuro. I was, I was like upper quartile, but not always number one. And I felt like guilty about that for whatever reason. She's like, dude, like, fucking chill. Relax. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, God, that's embarrassing to even recount that story. But um, if you do hard things and you earn the confidence and you earn that reputation with yourself, I'm not trying to tell Sean, oh, I'm this, this, and this. I'm trying to prove it to myself. Mm -hmm. Then I will not have imposter syndrome. Simple. And then people like, maybe there is a correlation between imposter syndrome being so common now and people doing a lot more shortcuts. So ultimately you have to think of the long-term cost because also let's say that you, it, it helps you a lot and you need that to now pass certain tests. Think about being on a certain substance, especially a prescription strength substance for years. The long-term ramifications and adverse effects of doing so. Those who are in med school, like you know what's up. You know there are issues with these drugs if you're using them, using them long-term and it's not indicated in you. I just think it's nonsense. I think it's a really, it's frustrating for me to see people that have so much more potential hold themselves back from their own just like weakness and 
I don't know, ignorance. I, I think it definitely gets worse the higher up in your education that you get because the people that you're surrounded by tend to just be the highest performers from kind of like the level you were just at, right? So when you're an undergrad, you know, you're comparing yourself to your other. You well, know, let's go back to high school, because in high school, sure, high school, everyone in college was like, yeah, I was like the college valedictorian. It's like exactly. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, and then you, you know, you kind of work your way up, and as you kind of again get higher in your education, the people you're surrounded by were the top of you know where you were just at. Yeah, going and from you, college to UCLA, yeah. it was like you shaved off a lot of a lot of people, and then going from yeah. UCLA to med school, you're like, oh my god, like these are some. Hardcore and people. then I think what happens is you start to look at what they're doing and what's working for them and all of a sudden you were like maybe the top scorer in your OCHEM class and now you're like in the middle of your med school class, right? And that can be hard. You start to see what they're doing That's and thinking, point. okay, I gotta start doing what they're doing. Oh, they're drinking, you know, this much caffeine or maybe they're taking Adderall even though maybe they need it and you don't, right? And I think by that comparison, that's why you start to get that imposter syndrome, especially as you get higher up. Uh, you start to try other things that you didn't necessarily rely on before for your studying, just out of that nervousness and that comparison. I think when people hit a wall or they don't get the results that they want, mm. they have that fixed mindset and they think that this is, this is them, this is reality. They don't yeah. understand that just about everything, almost everything, not your height, right? Not the color, well, I guess the color of your skin can be changed, but most things are. <laughs> like you go for a tan, you know what I mean? But Just Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> most things can be improved, their skills. Like, if you don't like public speaking, like I hated public speaking when I was in, in high school and college, I got better at it. Uh, if you don't like studying or you're not getting the, the test results you want, both mm. studying and test taking are two separate but interrelated skills that you can learn and improve. This sounds weird, but even the skill of like sleeping. If you have issues with energy throughout the day, is it your sleep, is it your exercise, is it your nutrition, is it a whole host of things? I think part of the reason I didn't need caffeine is that, and, and I didn't always sleep that well, but I was exercising a lot. I was being active, I was taking care of my body. I was eating really, really clean. And those things probably allowed me to operate at a much higher mental clarity and energy versus if I wasn't doing those things. There was this uh, kind of quote that I heard that basically if you start treating life as like a video game where you can start building up skill points and then allocating those skill points to certain skill sets, you start to advance further than if you were kind of just doing things like day by day or just as it happens. So kind of like what you're saying where if you want to get better at something, kind of treat it like a game, you know, set a roadmap for it and then see it as you're trying to become the best character of yourself. And I really like that kind of mentality because I think it applies to working out, studying, all that kind of stuff, especially those things that you can measure and get kind of like a tangible outcome in. You can see yourself you know, becoming a stronger character over time. I really like the analogy there. There's even an app, I think it was a habit tracking app or something like that, that tried to gamify that yeah. and incorporate that like real world oh, yeah. RPG what, what or whatever. I forgot what that was. Yeah, it was it was, it was was hyped a while back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's still around. Someone can comment below and let us know uh, the name and help out your fellow viewers. So, okay, TLDW. What's, TL, what's DW? Didn't watch. Oh. <laughs> Come on, bro, go with the times. Now who's the old man? Man, the boomer just came up with an acronym that I didn't know. <laughs> so, I think the, the main lesson here is you can get better results than you think you can yep. without having to resort to questionable methods. You put in the work, you grind, you reflect. Self-reflection, really powerful, and not just in studying, in a lot of areas in life, and you ask for feedback from people too. You do things the right way, it feels good, and it takes you so much further. Not only because you have now developed a skill set that's gonna carry you in the future, but also now you have that, that self-belief, that confidence that you earned by doing the difficult thing, rather than just telling yourself, like going to Maria, yeah. I'm, I'm successful, I'm great. No, prove it to yourself. I've mm -hmm. said this since the beginning of Med School Insiders, 2016. You don't fake it till you make it. That gives you imposter syndrome. You earn it. You do hard things and you prove it to yourself. Yep. And I think the payoff is even better when you maintain your ethics, your morals, and your integrity at the end of the road versus if you kind of take the shortcuts to get there. It might be the same outcome, but you're gonna be more proud of your accomplishment when you, again, finish with that integrity. So don't cheat, my friends. Much love. See you in that next one. Go give Sean. Dr. Anderson, follow. <laughs>